preaching machine, a modern day liberator, a woman of God, and a family member. Come on, Codor's Revival. Welcome to this stage, Christine, the Hurricane. Hey! Wow! It feels like. I think. You are all about to go into orbit. This is not normal. You know, I was so pumped when I found out that I was gonna be here on night three. Because you know, on the third day, oh yeah, we're gonna have some resurrection power in this place today. People are gonna be delivered. People are gonna be set free. I am so excited, you know. I um, am so honoured to be here, you're all my family. This is about, we're trying to work out probably my fourth or fifth time. The first time you come, you're a guest. But by now I'm just your crazy aunt from Down Under. (laughs) Y'all, everyone needs a crazy aunt. Now we say aunt, you say? Aunt. (laughs) You tread on an ant. I say awesome, you say? Awesome. Awesome, okay. Nick and I, I am here with the single most ravishing piece of masculine flesh on planet Earth. My husband of 20 years, that's over there, Nick. And we, we love Pastor Stephen and Holly, like family, like so much. You know, I um, kind of have known them now for many, many years. And I remember when I first saw Pastor Stephen and I'm um, considerably older than them. And I I just was like, my jaw was on the floor. And um, I thought, Lord, I think You have just raised up. And I mean, this is like, he was probably late 20s and going, uh, I think he's only still late 20s, but anyway, it was (laughs) when you're my age. But um, I I just remember my my jaw just stopping and um, I called Australia and I said, you know what, I don't know, but I think um, that I have just seen one of the greatest apostles, prophets, pastors, evangelists that God has raised up in our generation. And, And the truth is, it's true. Because here we are and every time I come here, it just gets better and better. And I mean, you know, you're a little bit like God here at Elevation. You're just omnipresent. It's just we're everywhere. I'm talking to you in this room, plus all of our other locations tonight and everyone else that's online. I'm so glad you've joined us because I've been the person on the other side of the screen um, for the last two nights. And I just, you know, so I know, I feel right where you are. The last two nights I've been ready to crawl through that camera going, I'm gonna be there. Um, But let me just say that I know that the presence of God's on the other side of this screen, the power of God's on the other side of this screen. God's gonna deliver and heal you wherever you are right now. It's not an accident that you've tuned in. And so we are just all connected. I want to show you, I have been part of the revival. Look, I've got my notes from the first night. I've got Pastor Stephen notes here, and then I've got Pastor John Gray's notes here and their boys, so I could fit all their notes here. I'm a girl, so these are all my notes for tonight. But I, I, I just, you, you got to know with God, things just get better and better and better and better. So we already started in orbit on night number one and it just went to another level night number two. And it's going to go to another level tonight, but everyone say tomorrow night. Oh, you don't want to miss tomorrow night. Now, here is the point. I, I'm not allowed to say who it is, but your pastor didn't say who it was last night either. And um, all I'm going to say, just to add to what he said, is the person that's on tomorrow night. No other person on the planet has more powerfully impacted my own spiritual walk with God. So you do not want to miss. You do not want to miss tomorrow night. It's going to be absolutely awesome. So why don't you just take a seat? I, I love this new facility, I, you guys, so anointed. Can we just thank God for this awesome, awesome team? So anointed. We've, we've talked about the rhythm of revival. We've talked about the sound of revival. How many know what we're gonna talk about tonight? Well, we'll see. We'll go where we go. But there's a, 
a time of revival as well. So you've got to get your rhythm right, you've got to get your sound right, and you better get your timing right. And, um, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. I want you to turn with me to the book of Exodus chapter 8 tonight. Exodus chapter 8. I love this. The Bible says in verse 1, Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh and say to him, This is what the Lord says. Let my people go so that they may worship me. If you refuse to let them go, I will send a plague of frogs on your whole country. I don't know if you think God's boring, but I've often kind of thought like, what is it that He sits in heaven and kind of goes like, what, frogs? Now, I I don't like many animals, you know, I know I'm in North Carolina, but you know, um, I just kind of have an aversion to especially these types of animals. So I couldn't think of anything worse than a plague of frogs, a literal, this is like not a fairy tale, this is like literal frogs. And a plague was coming on the whole country. So the Nile will teem with frogs. They will come up into your palace and your bedroom and onto your bed. That makes intimacy interesting. Into the houses. <laughs> Sunday night, man, we're gonna go, yeah, we're going there. Into your um, the houses of your officials and on your people and into your ovens and kneading troughs which is awesome. It wouldn't really impact me. I'm not sure when I last opened my oven, but anyway, I'm, it, would be, it would be interesting. It's so funny. My daughter at school, I've got, oh, let me show you. I've got a 14-year-old and a 10-year-old. I think we've got photos of my, my 14-year-old, Catherine Bobby, and um, she, there she is. I know, she's so beautiful. I love her with a passion, 14 going on 21. And, um, and then I have my 10-year-old, Sophia Joyce, who's just so cute. And... Um, where was I going with that? <laughs> oh, she was at school. And the teacher said to the whole class, what is your mother's favourite thing to make? And so all the kids in the class are saying, you know, my mummy, I mean, I'm, I'm in the South here. You'll make everything, you know. My mummy's favourite thing is like grits, I don't know. Like, um, you know, is, is this kind of cake or that kind of, and all the kids are putting, and then my daughter, she puts up her hand. Some of you, you came to Revival just for this. I'm about to set you free right now. I'm telling you. <laughs> she puts up her hand. And she goes, my mummy loves to make reservations. Okay, so that is it. I'm just letting everyone know someone just got set free tonight somewhere online. You're in revival right now. You're just running a lap around your room. So he says, they will come into your palace, into your bedroom, onto your bed, into the house of your officials, on the people and into your ovens and kneading troughs. The frogs will come up on you. And your people and all your officials. This is like, this is like getting terrible. If I was John Gray right now, I would start to sing, but I can't sing. (laughs) I do come from Hillsong, but if I sung Oceans, you would drown tonight. So it's not (laughs) going to happen. I'm just so sorry. You have to be a very secure woman to be part of our church for 28 years and only be able to sing in the shower. But anyway, that's okay. So... Then the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron, stretch out your hand with your staff over the streams and canals and ponds and make frogs come up on the land of Egypt. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt and the frogs came up and covered the land. But the magicians did the same things by their secret arts. They also made frogs come up on the land of Egypt. Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, pray to the Lord to take the frogs away from me and my people. I'm sure his mother, I mean, his wife would have just hassled him the night before. So he thought worse than a plague of frogs is a nagging wife. So I am gonna go there. And I will let your people go to offer sacrifices to the Lord. Moses said to Pharaoh, I leave to you the honour of setting the time. Everyone say the time. (laughs) Setting the time for me to pray for you and your officials and your people that you and your houses may be rid of the frogs except for those that remain in the Nile. Tomorrow, Pharaoh said, Moses replied, it will be as you say, so that you may know there is no one like the Lord our God. The frogs will leave you and your house, your officials and your people, and they will remain only in the Nile. After Moses and Aaron left Pharaoh, Moses cried out to the Lord about the frogs he had brought on Pharaoh. And the Lord did what Moses asked. The frogs died in the houses, in the courtyards and in the fields. They were piled into heaps and the land reeked of them. I bet you're so glad you came out to Revival tonight. It's just like, (laughs) this is awesome. And um, we're learning about frogs and the land reeking of them. Now, I find this a really fascinating story. Obviously, we're here in the book of Exodus and the children of Israel have been in slavery, in bondage, in captivity for 430 years. 
I rescue the victims of human trafficking today. I, I thank God for you at Elevation Church who are just such a key partner church in all that we do. Nick and I just came back literally to here from we were just in Qatar and in Jakarta, in Indonesia and in Athens, Greece, where we're working in 50 of the different camps, helping to identify the victims of human trafficking. And so I wanna just take a moment to say thank you. Because of you, we have 14 offices in 14 countries around the world. And we've just opened a brand new office right here in Charlotte, North Carolina, which is pretty phenomenal. So you guys are unbelievable, but slavery is real. I say all of that, slavery still exists today. The children of Israel were in slavery. They had cried out to God, God had heard their cry, but Pharaoh's heart was hardened. So the Lord sent a series of plagues in order to soften Pharaoh's heart so he would let the children of Israel go free. Now we're here and there were 10 10 plagues that were sent and really unusual things, locusts and flies and boils. I mean, it was just like, oh, messy. And so this plague was a plague of frogs. Now when God sent a plague, it was like a legit plague. The Bible says the whole country was filled with it. So there were plagues everywhere as we read in the text. Plagues in the ponds, plagues in the rivers, plagues on the streets, plagues in your house, plagues in your bed, plagues of frogs everywhere. Everywhere you went, you went to the bathroom, there was a frog. You went into bed, there was a frog. You went into the kitchen, there was a frog. Here a frog, there a frog, everywhere a frog, frog. There were frogs everywhere. And so then obviously, Mrs. Pharaoh goes, look, I I don't don't want this anymore. So Mr. Mr. Pharaoh goes to Moses. An interesting passage of Scripture. And he says, you know what, Moses, can you go? And tell your God that I will do what you want. I will let the people go. I will set them free. Just get rid of these frogs. They have come all the way through our whole country. We are sick of being plagued with frogs. We are sick of the inconvenience. We are sick of the plague. We are sick of the diseases. So tell your God that I just will do whatever He wants. So Moses says, okay then, Pharaoh. That is awesome. This is the Christine paraphrase translation. It's not in the NIV, but it it is like this if you read between the lines. But he says, God is able to get rid of these frogs. God is willing to get rid of these frogs. God wants to get rid of the frogs. So Pharaoh, please tell me, when would you like me to pray to God, to ask God to get rid of the frogs? And then Pharaoh says one of the weirdest things things in the entire Bible. Right there in Exodus chapter 8, verse 10, Pharaoh answers and he says, tomorrow. (laughs) I, I don't know if you think that's unusual or if it's just me. Tomorrow. God was willing to get rid of the frogs today. God was able to get rid of the frogs today. God wanted to get rid of the frogs today. But Pharaoh says, Tomorrow, I'm not here tonight on night three of Code Orange Revival to pontificate as to why a few thousand years ago, Pharaoh wanted to spend one more night with his frogs. I'm here to ask you, what are the frogs that are in you, on you, around you, surrounding you, that have got you in bondage, that have been plaguing you? And God says, I am willing to set you free. I am able to set you free. And you come into church night after night, week after week, and you say, God, I want to be free, but I want it tomorrow. Oh, you want to know, yes, there is a rhythm for revival. There is a sound for revival. But let me tell you, there's also a time for revival. And the time is now. And the place is here. And you are the person. Today is your day of freedom. You don't have to wait until tomorrow. God says, today. Today, I am utterly convinced that more of us are walking around in bondage than we ever need to. Because we answer just like Pharaoh did in this text. We say, tomorrow. I'll get around to it tomorrow. You know, today's sermon is um, called Yesterday, You Said Tomorrow. Thank you, Nike. And if we put up... In 2008, Nike ran an ad. I think we've got the image for that advertisement. There you go. Yesterday, you said tomorrow. And they 
rolled that out amongst schools in 2008. And basically they were telling athletes, nothing gets done. You're not gonna play football if you don't go training today. You're not gonna graduate from college if you don't start studying today. You are not going to be relationally functional if you don't start working on yourself today. It was just looking at all different spheres of life. And it says, hey, yesterday, you said tomorrow. And we're in today, which is yesterday's tomorrow, but you have not done anything yet because you're still waiting for tomorrow. And the thing that I have discovered is most people exist in today, but live in yesterday and never step into the tomorrow that God has for them because they refuse to do something today. They refuse to do the thing that God has called for them to do today. And so we have come here not to play games. We've come here to say, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of deliverance. Today is the day of freedom. Today is the day of healing. You know, next week, next week I turn 50 years old. Yes, please send presents. (laughs) You have to send presents, just click and donate to my Walk for Freedom. That's okay, you can do that. But I... I um, turned 50, and so I've been doing this for a lot of years now, 28 years. And I have wondered, why is it that some people step into the fullness of the destiny that God has for them? And some people walk in freedom and others don't. We sit under the same teaching. We have access to the same resources. We read the same Bible. It's the same Jesus that came for all of us. Why is it that some seem to move forward? Is it that just God has favourites? And he doesn't, I'm utterly convinced that's not the case. That's why this revival is so important. That's why, see the the issue in America right now, it's it's not a political problem or a social problem or a moral problem or economic problem. I mean, it's nothing new. All these issues have always been happening. It's a faith problem. We've got too many unbelieving believers. We need some believing believers that absolutely will trust that God is who He says He is, that God can do what He says He can do and He will do what He says He can do. But we've got to live by faith ourselves so that the world around us can see the light of Christ shining through us in order to bring transformation to our world. But the issue is I'm convinced that you think, how can you sit, your your pastor, and I'm not just saying this, it is absolutely true, is probably one of the, the greatest preachers without doubt of our generation in terms of everything, truth and delivery in every way. Now I wanna know though, how can you sit under that every week? And this part of the church might move forward and yet this part won't or this part, is it His fault? No. Exactly, right answer. (laughs) The issue is this, that we sit under it. I'm convinced that we we sincerely wanna break through wherever you are on whatever campus right now. Even those of you online, you would be tuning in if you did not want a breakthrough. I mean, you could be doing 10 other things tonight. I know people think you're weird. You mean you're going to 10 nights of revival? Well, you know, I come from Australia. People go to the pub a lot. No one thought you were weird if you went to the pub for 10 nights. So I don't know why they think you're weird if you go to revival for 10 nights. But anyway, so yes, click on for 10 nights. And so what happens is that we come and we sit under the teaching. So we had a fantastic exhortation about an offering and tithes. And we think that that's a really good idea. I want to, I want, I'm going to start tithing, but I'm going to start tomorrow. Oh yeah, yeah, I know. Wow. Pastor Stephen and Holly just did a fantastic series. I listen every week in case you're wondering, just to make sure they stay on track. Anyway, so no, because it feeds my soul on, on relationships. And you know, our marriage has got a lot of problems, but and we will get around to implementing some of those principles or getting some help. We sincerely will, but we're going to do it tomorrow. I know my kids have got some issues. We were just like, and I know that I'm going to deal with it, but it's just too much right now. So I'm going to do it tomorrow. I know that I'm spending more than I'm earning and my bank account's going the other way. And I'm going to stop all that extra credit card spending. And I'm going to stop, but I'm going to stop tomorrow. I know that I'm having just that extra glass of wine every night. And and I know that I need to stop, but I'm going to do it tomorrow and I, I know I need to, to stop sleeping with that person that I'm not married to and, 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 and you know, but, and I'm going to stop, but I'm gonna stop going over there tomorrow. 
and the list just keeps going. And then we find ourselves 10 years on in this Christian walk and, and nothing's changed and we've gone to 10 nights of revival oh, and we know the rhythm and we know the sound, but we haven't stepped into the time because the time is now and the time is today and the time is this moment, this second. This is when we have to do it. At some point, you have got to make a decision that today I'm gonna implement this truth today. I'm gonna get in a small group today. I'm gonna get planted in church today. I'm gonna start tithing today. I'm gonna start dealing with my stuff because there is no tomorrow. If you do not deal with yesterday today, you will never step into tomorrow. Most Christians never step into their future because they live in their past and they exist in today and it's one big Groundhog Day. That's all that happens. So you've got to make a decision today. Today. So the Lord is raising, and we're in an intensive boot camp here, but it is amazing to me how many of us will never ever deal with yesterday. Oh, we'll talk about yesterday. We'll stay stuck in yesterday. You know, one of the greatest worship bands in history, you too, wrote a song, Stuck in a Moment. It says, you've got to get yourself together. You got stuck in a moment and now you can't get out of it. It is astounding to me how many of us got stuck in some moment, some moment of our past, a moment of offence, a moment of abuse, a moment of rejection, a moment of failure, a moment of shame, a moment of neglect, some moment. And you might be sitting here today, but everything about your emotions, everything about your choices, everything about your decisions is actually rooted in yesterday. And you have never stepped into any kind of future. Because unless you deal with your yesterday today, there is no tomorrow. And so you can come and you can pray and fast and stand on your head, but you are not gonna step into your tomorrow until you deal with your yesterday. Now, the truth is, a lot of us don't step into tomorrow also because we are so fixated with what God did yesterday that we have got no clue of what God's gonna be doing tomorrow. I want you to look at this Scripture with me, Isaiah 43. And the Bible says in Isaiah 43, 18 to 19, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. That's both good and bad. Both good and bad. It is amazing. Some people, you're 40 years old and you've got this trophy room with all of your college football (laughs) trophies and medals up there. And now you haven't kicked a football in 15 years and your feet couldn't reach the football through your stomach anyway. So you're just, um, so you know, it's been a long time. But you talk about those days, but you actually haven't done anything since those days. And so the Lord says, see, I am doing a new thing. Now, everyone say, now. Now. I wear a code orange and God's saying, now it springs up. Do you not? Perceive it. I'm convinced so much of the body doesn't perceive it. God says, now I'm doing a new thing. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wastelands. I think a lot of Christians are not perceiving it because all they're doing is talking about the fear and the doubt and the negativity in the atmosphere or they're talking about what this nation once was, what God once did, how great it once was. And God says, He was talking to the Israelites in Babylonian exile at this time. And He said, you keep looking back to the first Exodus and you keep wanting me to do what I did then. But do you not understand when I'm getting ready to bring you out of Babylon. I'm doing a brand new thing. Behold, it's going to be greater than the former thing that I ever did. America, you don't have to look back. Start looking forward. I'm doing a new thing and it is going to eclipse the old thing that I did. Elevation Church, I've done awesome things in and through you for the last 10 years. But you know what? Now that you've given me some glory, don't look back. Forget it because your greatest days are ahead of you. You haven't even seen what I've got for you yet. I want you to look forward. Don't build a monument to the past and dwell on it. God says, do you not perceive it? Behold, I do a new thing now. We miss the now moment. He says, now I'm doing it. Now I'm doing it. He didn't say I'm doing the next thing. 
What's happening at Card Orange Revival? What's happening at Elevation Church? I want you to hear me. It's not the next thing. It's the new thing. There's a very big difference between the next thing and the new thing. You see, secular marketers, they're looking for the next. Who's the next big artist coming through? Who's the next celebrity coming through? What's the next unique product coming through? Oh, we want the next, we want the next because we just wanna put you through a machine and it's gonna come through. God says, no, 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 I don't do two of the same thing. When you say next in the body of Christ, that normally means you want the same old thing in a younger body. I'm not doing the same old thing in a younger body. This is new wine that I'm pouring into a new wine skin. Behold, I'm doing a new thing. And I'm doing it now. It's not the next thing. It's not the same old thing. It's a new thing. That's why you can't put words on it. That's why this does not make sense. Doesn't make sense. Because God says, no, 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 no. I'm not pouring new wine into an old wine skin. See, sometimes we think just because it's a, it's, a, it's a new exterior shell. He goes, oh no, you can have an old body and give it a facelift. God doesn't give His church a facelift. He says, I'm not giving it a facelift. I'm doing a brand new thing. I'm doing a brand new thing. You don't have to freak out while we sit around and go, oh no, this is how it used to be. And it was so, He goes, what do you mean? That's how great it was. What I've got for America, her destiny is greater than her history. What I have for her through our church is absolutely awesome. It's just a new thing. It just doesn't look like the old thing. God is the only one that can remain entirely the same, but do an entirely different thing. We don't need what He did before. We need what He's gonna do now, today, in this nation, in this generation. That's what we need God to do. And He says, I'm raising up my church. The naysayers can say what they want. People can be full of fear. But 2,000 years ago, Jesus declared, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not, cannot, will not prevail against the church of the living God. They cannot. They cannot. So that is why we can have a revival in the midst of political, economic, social and moral upheaval because God is still on the throne and God still reigns. He's doing a new thing. Don't try to name it too quickly. What's happening here, it's a new thing. I've been around the block for 28 years. It's a new thing. He says, do you not perceive it? You me sit down. And so what we have to do in order to perceive the new thing is some of us have got to deal with some of the old stuff. And the truth is that the enemy wants to keep you trapped in your past. You know, I, I've got a PhD in this one. I feel like I could talk with a little bit of authority. Because the fact is that I told you next week I, I turn 50, but... Naturally speaking, (laughs) I shouldn't even be here. I shouldn't even be here. This is why I know this to be true. I sat in meetings like this, just like many of you people on the other side of the screen on all of our campuses today. And you know what I thought in the early days? Well, I would love to believe what that preacher's saying. But if they only knew my past, (sighs) and there's people here and you're, you're, you're listening to this, you wanna be part of the new thing and you want God to use you and you're thinking, I. I can't, and I think this is why we spend week in and week out sitting in church under some of the greatest revelation in modern church history and nothing changes. Because at some point we disqualify we ourselves. We exclude ourselves and we think, well, well, well I, I can't do that because you don't know my background. Now many of you know my story and many of you don't. We've grown so much since I've been here. But for those of you that don't, I was born in Sydney, Australia and you know, the daughter of second generation migrant Greeks before my big fat Greek wedding. It was not cool to be Greek when I was growing up. (laughs) I was very marginalised because of my ethnicity and my gender in in a culture that did not esteem women at all. I was left in a hospital when I was born unnamed and unwanted. I, I didn't know that until I was 33 years old. I didn't find out I was adopted. And I was sexually abused most weeks of my life, often several times a week. 
by four different men for over a decade, for 12 years of my life. So I was a young woman that was full of unforgiveness. I was full of shame. I was full of bitterness. I was full of anger. I was not who you see today. And by the world standards, I should be a statistic. Most young women with my kind of background, they end up either drug dependent or alcohol dependent or maybe two or three different kids to two or three different fathers or confused about their gender identity. I mean, that's often what happens to people with my kind of brokenness. And the fact is that 28 years ago, I encountered a living, resurrected Saviour, Jesus Christ. And the truth is that at some point I made a decision that I wasn't just going to listen to somebody on a stage like a spectator. But at some point I was going to say, you know what? If this is true, if this is true about this Jesus, then today I'm going to make a decision that I'm going to step into what they are saying. I'm going to appropriate it into my life and I'm going to begin to progress. And see, a lot of people go, well, Chris, that's just because of your personality type. Because you're just like strong. Look, I don't know, last time you checked your Bible, but let me just go on record as saying this. Freedom is not based on a personality type. It's based on a blood type, the blood of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. It sets every person free. Whatever your personality is, whatever your love language is, wherever you fit on the Briggs Meyer scale, it's got nothing to do with you and everything to do with what Jesus Christ attained for us at Calvary. So we can all be free. But why aren't we? Because many of us sit in environments like this and go, awesome. I'm going to do what she said tomorrow. And at some point, I made a decision that I wasn't just going to shout at the revival, but that today I was going to apply what was said. That today I was going to begin to believe the truth of this Word and make it happen. You know, let me just tell you something. The blood of Jesus does not give you amnesia. (laughs) See, that's what some of us think. Well, you know, that's how we treat our past, which is why we don't step into our future. Because we go, it didn't happen. It's under the blood. It's under the blood. It's under the blood. Or I'm going to act in and just pretend I'm a good Southern girl. We don't talk about those things. (laughs) And we just carry all that baggage into our marriages and your husband's paying for something he never did to you. Your children are paying for something they never did because you live one eternal yesterday in today and you never step into tomorrow because you haven't dealt with it. And the fact is at some point, you've got to say, Jesus, come in. Come in and do what only you can do in my life. See, a lot of us, we've allowed one season, one moment to define us. Look, I was abused for 12 years. Nothing is gonna change that, nothing. But next week I turn 50, so let's do the math. I was abused for 12 years. I cannot change the past. But I have not been being abused for 38 years. So why am I going to allow 12 years to define my entire life, to define my entire destiny? You've allowed one moment, one chapter, one mistake, one incident to define your whole life. Now the enemy has already robbed that season of your past, the best thing you can do is turn around today and begin to walk into the future that God has for you. Today, today. So at some point we've got to make a decision. I'm going to do it for those of you. I'm going to put up a a document because I want you to see a lot of us go, well, Christine, you don't know the facts. This is what you have to do if you want to walk in freedom. If you want to deal with your yesterday so that you can walk in freedom today and therefore step into tomorrow then you are going to have to partner with God. Jesus did everything that He needs to do. I am living proof. He did it all. Whatever your past was, I was left in a hospital unnamed. I was sexually abused. I grew up in the third poorest zip code in all of Australia. I don't know what your pain is and I'm not belittling anybody's. 
But I am saying there is a life beyond our past. I am saying there is freedom. I am saying I refuse to join this movement that seems to be sweeping the world. Just just says, you know, wallow in your brokenness, accept your brokenness, accept your bondage. I'm saying, no, you don't need to. Jesus came to set us free and He whom the Son sets free shall be free indeed. You don't need to just be free. You can be free indeed. It is for freedom. Christ set us free. Freedom. So when I was born, and this is very meaningful to me right now because it's, you know, half a century ago, almost to the week, half a century ago. How bizarre when the enemy tried to destroy me in my mother's womb, that didn't work. So here I am. And a lot of us, this is what we do. We go, well, Christine, you don't know the facts. You should see the fact. Why should I come to the revival night? I've already got the report from the doctor. It says it's incurable. It says it's terminal. It says it's finished. Christine, why should I come to the revival night? You don't know what the facts say. You don't know what they said about me at school. Look, I've got a black and white ink on paper. Christine, you don't know the facts. You don't, you don't know what the government has said or what this document says. And we build all our life on the facts. Well, I'll show you what the facts said about me. So here it is. If you bring this is here. Particulars of child prior to adoption. Child's name, unnamed. See, who's got that typed in? Typed in, the word is typed in, unnamed. Number 2508 of 1966. That's why human trafficking numbers to me will never be numbers. Because if I wasn't born in Australia and I was born where I'm rescuing kids from, they're just a number. If I say to you 27 million slaves, you think, what's that? Numbers are numbing, numbers are dehumanising, numbers are desensitising. It's easy to ignore suffering when it's nameless and faceless. If I said to you, number 2508, you just would have went, yeah, but the minute I say to you, that's me, changes everything, changes everything. So there I am, unnamed. Then I'll show you another document from the Royal Hospital for Women, which is where I was born. Now, this was written two weeks before I was born. And my biological mother went in to have an assessment done. And this is what they said. Now, I'll just give you an excerpt. I think if you get that, she does not seem to be too emotionally involved with the child. She seems to wanna get it all over and done with and get back to work as soon as possible. So now I have, I've got the facts. I'm I'm not in denial. People go, Christine, you're just a little happy clappy, blab it and grab it. You just live in delirium land, you know, bless it and confess it and you just don't live in reality. So let me just tell you all, I'm living in reality. I'm not denying the black and white ink on paper. There it is, I can see it. And of course, you know, the first one was from the, we'll just go one more and then, I'll give you just a short excerpt. So here we are today by the grace of God, 2016. We have 14 A21 offices in 12 countries around the world. Just this week, while I'm standing here, we're part of the US delegation to APEC, which I won't get too technical with you, but it's, it's in um, a, a big delegation in the Pacific um, and we are represented there. We were just in, we're just launching a big project in Northern Iraq. We've got countries around the world. I've got people right here in North America being rescued um, every day. God's doing quite amazing things. We run one of the largest uh, specifically anti-human trafficking organisations in the world. We're working with the UNHCR um, and we're working with the Red Cross in Europe. I'm not telling you that, I'm just telling you that for this reason because I want you to know what the experts said about me. On the 28th of March, 1993, before many of you were born, I know, but I want you to know, at that time I was running a community-based youth centre in Australia, um, but we were faith-based and they didn't like that. And the most prestigious university in Australia that ran a social work school. Their students wanted to do their placements in our university, but my degree is in English and economic history. So basically I can count to 10 and read golden books. And so they didn't think that I was qualified to be able to look at the students. Now, remember since then, this is now 23 years ago, by God's grace, I've preached in over 69, not over, in 69 countries of the world to -to face-to-face millions of people, literally, because I've just had some awesome opportunities with Joyce Meyer to preach at times to a million people at a time in in India. And no, I just want you to get, I'm just setting this up to go, I'm not in any way exaggerating. This is what happened, but I want you to know what the experts said about me. And so here's from the University of New South Wales, and I'll just give you this. If your career ambition is to remain in the area of youth services in the longer term, I would strongly urge you to take time out to study for a basic social work, welfare work or other relevant professional qualifications. The comments I've made may be difficult for you to digest, but they reflect my honest assessment of the most appropriate way forward for you. I see you as a young woman with enormous innate potential. She was prophetic. And I sincerely hope that you will enhance your innate aptitude by formal training that will provide you with the theoretical basis that you need to complement your many talents, basically unqualified. And so just, I know someone that wrote a really good book about that. So here we go. 
so here we go. In here, if you put those three documents up, because we talk about black and white ink on paper. I'm not denying it. The first one is it's from the government. And we know, of course, if it's from the government, it's got to be true. So there it is. It says black and white, ink on paper, unnamed. I'm not denying it. There it is, black and white, ink on paper from the medical profession. Unwanted, there it is. Black and white, ink on paper from the education department. Unqualified, there it is, I've got it. I'm unnamed, unwanted, unqualified. I could spend my whole life looking at my past, defining everything by what is in my past, by what they said, by what they did. But you know what, church? I found another black and white ink on paper. I found myself another black and white ink on paper. Far more powerful than the facts. And it's called the truth of the Word of God. And that document says that I am unnamed. But Isaiah 49 verse 1 says, From the womb of your mother, I have named your name. That document says I am unwanted. But Psalm 139 says, Before you ever got in that womb, I wanted you. That document says that I'm unqualified. But my Bible says, He whom He calls, He qualifies. You have got to make the facts of God's Word, the truth of God's Word, bigger than the facts. This is your key tonight. For some of you, you've got to stop looking back and stop limiting yourself by what you've done or by what others have done to you. You have got to make what Jesus Christ did for you bigger than what anybody else has said or done to you. That's what you've got to do if you are going to move into the fullness of what He has. I'm telling you, when I set up my birthday appeal this year, I thought half a century, 50 years ago, devil, you wanted to kill me and you have sent her and I am going to bring more freedom because Genesis in Romans 8, 28, God says, He'll work all things together for good. It doesn't mean what happened to me was good, but God said, you know what, Chris, I'll take all of those bad things and I'll work them together for good. Every time, every time we put a trafficker in jail, every time we rescue a girl, I feel like Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, when Joseph looked at his brothers and he said, you meant this for evil against me, but God meant it for this very purpose to save many people alive. Your destiny is greater than your history, but you must decide today, today, that you're gonna appropriate the truth of the Word of God. I'll give you one last story and then our time is up. At some point, you've got to be willing to embrace the pain of recovery. When I snapped my ACL and I had scar tissue form, wounds heal over, but scar tissue, it's the body's defence mechanism that causes it to heal itself. And some of you, God's brought you and you need to come to all 10 nights. Pastor Stephen set it up beautifully about the reign of God's Word because I'll tell you what happens is breaking down the scar tissue. When the PT came to me, he said, Christine, I had done the worst injury you could ever do. He said, you can recover from this quickly or slowly, totally or partially. He said, it's up to you. Most people never fully recover from this injury, not because they can't. He said, in fact, after your hamstring graft, your right knee is stronger than your left knee. He said, but the point is most people do not, do not wanna embrace the pain of recovery. He said, the injury happened in a second, but the recovery takes six painful months. Often the recovery process takes longer than the actual injury that happened. The abuse that happened to me, it happened. But the scars and the wounds and the pain and the unforgiveness and the bitterness and the rejection and the hurt and the brokenness and the feeling of unworthiness. In in my book, Unashamed, I talked to you even about as recently as two years ago, some more scar tissue that God said, come on, if I'm gonna take you to another level, I've gotta go in deeper and we've gotta break some more of that scar tissue and Christine, it hurts but the degree to which you are willing to embrace the pain of recovery is the degree to which you will recover and find freedom and wholeness and healing. So you can sit down and we're gonna get going. I wanna tell you why we do all of this, why are we having a revival at a a time in America's history where I don't know that there's anything more important than we're doing in this nation than having this corporate gathering for 10 nights 
to declare and decree some things into the atmosphere to allow the reign of God to bring healing. Because if God's gonna do extraordinary things through you, and that's the mission statement of our church, we're here to see what God could do through us. Well, the fact is, if we don't unclog some of the junk in us, we're gonna clog the flow of the Spirit of God through us to do some things in the world around us. So the degree to which you allow God to go deep and do a work in you will determine what God can do through you. Not your gift or your talent. Your gift and your talent will take you to a place if your character cannot keep you there, you will self-sabotage. It's the way it will happen. And so at the end of the day, we need God to do that work in us and it's not just for us. The generations of this nation are at stake. The generations that are to come out of you are at stake. I've got by the grace of God, two beautiful daughters now, but when I think of where I should have ended up, And if I fixated on my past and didn't make a decision that today I'm gonna start to walk into the fullness of the promises of God and appropriate the Word of God, however painful it is, I'm going to begin to do it because the pain of regret will be far greater than the pain of healing and restoration. So I'm not prepared to stay there. And I remember I was at a conference in England So shout out to the dude from England. I'm glad you're here. The motherland, thank you. I'm just a convict from down under, but that's okay. So you're in America, mate. Boston, they threw you overboard, but we we stay true to the Queen. Okay, so stay on track. My time's up. So we're in Bedworth and um, I was in Bedworth, England speaking, and it's near a place called Stratford-upon-Avon, which is where William Shakespeare wrote all of his works and he lived and, you know, I told you I'm an English major. So, you know, I'm one of those weirdos that did Shakespeare University for several years. And so I thought, I'm gonna go to Stratford-upon-Avon and I'm gonna visit Willie. And I wanted to see if Willie was going to be home, but I went to Willie's house and he wasn't there because he's dead. And so I, I just kind of walked around and I went across the road, there was a shop. There was sort of like a store that was a, a genealogy store. And um, my husband, is the 12th of 13 living children. His mother had 15 full-term pregnancies in 17 years. Yes, there was no television in that part of Australia. And so he, um, so, but he's from good British stock. And so I thought I might be married to royalty and he never told me. We might, you know, Downton Abbey, I might have a big house somewhere. He might be a lord or a baron or a knight. I'm gonna go and check this out. So I went in and I put in the name Cain. Now I'm thinking Lord, Baron, Knight, Downton Abbey, you know, whatever. No joke, as God is my witness, it spits out this chart and this is, it's got all his family history. And next to it, all his like pirates, pirates, criminals, murderers, thieves, (laughs) good bloodline. And I was walking down the street and I'm thinking, man, I married good stock, good bloodline there, that's awesome. And then I started to laugh out loud because I thought this is awesome. On this side, I've got pirates and criminals and convicts and murderers. And on this side, I've got abuse and abandonment and adoption and rape and incest and addiction. And it's just, I go, that's awesome. Then I started to smile. Because I thought, you know what? Several years from now, my daughters are one day gonna walk into a genealogy shop. And you know, the truth is that they're gonna put in the name Cain and it's gonna spit out a child. And we could do nothing to change the past. None of us can. So when they spit it out, it'll still have on this side pirates and murderers and criminals and thieves. And over here, it'll still have adultery and fornication and lust and greed and addictions and and, and divorce. And it'll still have all of that. You can't change it. But then my daughters will look and it'll go, whoa, 30th of March, 1996. Everything changes because before that, You're not gonna change any of that, but on the 30th of March, 1996, Nicholas Joseph Kane marries Holy Ghost terrorist, Christine Kane. And on that day, we drew a bloodline in 